you're from California, you already know a lot about more about wine than people in Oklahoma do. And so that's how that started. I've worked for several distributorships, then I worked in retail, and then I've attended several conferences like Texom, and I've done some WSET testing and CMS testing. So a lot of self-education when it comes to wine, but what I always try to emphasize when I do these classes, and this is the first time I've ever done anything online, um, usually it's in person, is that um, wine is subjective. So any anytime you're interacting with someone who's got some education or background, um, just keep in mind that if you don't get something from that wine that they're saying should be there, or you are getting something else, um, you're right. You're always right when it comes to wine, because if you like it, you're correct. If you don't like it, you're correct. If you, I mean, just love what you love, because this is all about um, interacting with people, and so much about wine culture is just the social aspect of it. Uh, so we're just here to kind of give you some background information and maybe add to your experience. Um, and I'm thrilled to do this. Uh, I'm drinking, I don't have the 2016 of uh, Vinamoto Cabernet, but I am having a 2013 Napa um, Cab Malbec uh, Merlot blend today. So I'm very excited to open that. I've kind of slowly been chipping away at everything in my cellar uh, throughout this experience. So it's really nice to open up this bottle on such a special occasion like this. So um, I'll toss it over to Audre and she can give me a little background on what we were thinking with the class. Okay, hi everybody. Um, Nate and I have the 2009 Cabernet Sauvignon right now, and then we also have the 2016 that we'll be moving on to. Um, since people have been placing orders, uh, whenever Nate goes to get wine from the case storage, he just kind of, whatever he can scrounge around and get to, he's been bringing in. So it's really awesome to be able to taste the 09 Cab, and we do have some in the tasting room as well. Um, this was my first favorite Cab ever. And so I'm super excited to get to taste it. Um, really what I was looking for in doing this class, number one, to collaborate with my sister, because even though we're in the same industry and we have been for quite some time, it's just not something that we've ever considered doing because we live so far apart. So I'm really grateful to have this experience and then also be able to connect with all our people because we miss you so much. We don't get to see you anymore and or not anymore but for now we don't get to see you so to be able to taste some wine and talk about it and um, just have a really great hopefully uh, interactive experience and learn a little bit too so that's all i was hoping for and we had our first question already um uh jim had asked if um for sheila what is the um w set testing ah w set uh, of wine and spirits education testing. So um, in wine worlds, there's a variety of different wine education programs you can go to. They're all very helpful. Some are driven by ac more academically driven. Some are driven by hospitality. Um, WSET is more of an all encompassing. So um, I did work retail and I was a rep for a period of time. So in addition to wine, that means I've also got certifications in whiskeys and tequilas and gin and soju and bitters and cordials and all those good things. So um, it'll kind of become a little more clear. Uh, we're going to do a really, um, Andrea and Nate are going to give you guys so much great information about what they do and kind of behind the scenes with pH balances and the testing trials. Um, I'm going to do my best to cover the kind of scientific lab stuff and make it as entertaining as possible for you guys. Um, so all things kind of imbibable. It even, uh, Debbie said even includes tea and coffee. Uh, tea has tannins um, as just coffee. So uh, kind of just beverage education. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, I've done a lot of it. I kind of pumped the brakes on it because at some point, um, if you're not in hospitality, if you're not a beverage director working at a restaurant, you kind of max out on how practical that is. Um, and really, I've been focusing on wine education and trying to like just share that knowledge because I, what I've learned is the more people know um, about what they're consuming, the better choices they make and it, the more fun it is for everybody. So um, WSET is, uh, comes out of England. Um, here we have CMS, which is the Corps de Master Sommeliers, and I'm a level one psalm, but um, all of those things, there's a lot of different directions to go as far as beverage uh, certification. Uh, I am not a psalm. 
to the degree where uh, I could, I mean, I do blind tastings, that's kind of the fun part, but I've never worked in a restaurant. So I've never uh, taken that path because I've been much more focused on wine education. Good question. Um, yeah. And at any time, please, um, if, if anybody is using some wine language that just goes like this, uh, hopefully in the beginning part of this, we'll cover some things. Um, yeah, raise your hand because I kind of go start talking wine lingo and if it's something that isn't tinging for you, um, then yeah, ask a question because I'm just going to proceed. But we're going to talk a little about what, even tasting wine and what are, we, what are the components when we're tasting our wine. Um, so if you guys are ready, we can kind of do um, kind of a little 101 on what even wine is. So are yeah, we ready to go? Okay, I made a little, this is when I talk about the boring science part of wine. Um, what's the difference between grape juice and wine? It's about fermentation. And here's my little chart for you. Here's my little, I call him a yeasty boy. He looks like a little Pac-Man. And all wine is basically yeast and sugar makes alcohol and CO2. When we hold on to the CO2, we make sparkling wine. When we let it go, we have alcohol. So why is, why are grapes so good for making wine versus pineapples or apples or anything else? Because the grape in itself is a little ball of water. Here it is right here. It's the perfect design for wine. So even back in Greece, if somebody just had a handful of grapes and they had some kind of container, all you had to do is introduce the yeast that's on the outside of the grape to the natural sugar and water and that fermentation process will start and we'll start to get alcohol. So the earliest wines um, were unfiltered, um, but they were pretty boozy, right? Because all you had to do is mash those grapes up and then contain it and babysit it every once in a while. So the grape in itself um, is just the perfect vehicle for creating fermentation. And then we start talking about different components like climate and weather and what are the different things that affect these grapes that are gonna change our different wines. Um, so the grape is just a perfect little fermentation machine. Um, we want that natural sugar to occur. The warmer it is, the more sugar there is, which we'll come into a little bit later. Um, but this is essentially um, just a scientific little perfection of what makes fermentation happen. So without even knowing that, somebody figured out they could smash up grapes and get a little boozy treat at the end of the day. Um, so having a basic knowledge of fermentation is very important and then knowing that uh, the grape itself needs to be protected. We need that skin to keep separate from the sugar or the fermentation is gonna start before we want it to. So I don't know how many of you guys have participated in Crush um, with Dre and Nate at all, but what you're doing is you're feeding that yeast. It's hungry, it wants that sugar, and as soon as that starts to happen, that alcohol is going to start to result in there. And so that's the very first step in winemaking process. Um, like I said, that's the kind of boring, boring science part um, that you're going to talk about. Um, and then from there, you can start making decisions um, in the winemaking. Andrea or Nate, if you guys want to pipe up and talk about what the first thing you guys do after you guys crush those grapes, sure. um, that would be, yeah, give them a little intro to that. So before the grapes come in, we go out into the vineyard and we do an aggregate sample of the vineyard block that we'll be picking. And so what we do, um, and we take the sample, we um, look at the seed color and um, the brittleness of the seeds. We're looking at the color of the skins once it's separated from the juice, because the juice, as she was saying, is primarily water. And then we're tasting it, and then we're also taking a sample, and then we mash that up and then we test it with our refractometer so that we can see the bricks level, degrees bricks, and that's the sugars. And so the reason we do all of that, some people just take the bricks level, but we also wanna see everything else to see uh, the maturity and ripeness of the fruit. Um, but the bricks level tells us a lot and tells us kind of, you know, if we look at the weather coming up over the next week, we take this bricks level, then we can estimate about how much the bricks are going to change over the coming days so that we can plan our picking date um, in advance. So that's part of it. Um, but then 
we bring it in, we hand sort everything, we crush it, and we put it into fermentation bins, which are usually about 100 gallons with the, the skins and the juice all together. And then immediately what we first do, we stir it up with our punch down stick, and then we t test the bricks level again, because that's going to determine a lot of things. And we also taste it, uh, mix it up, mixed up all together. But once we know the bricks level of the actual grapes, once they've been crushed, then we can make decisions about um, and how much that we have. We can make decisions about the nutrients. Uh, we can make decisions about um, you know how long the fermentation is going to take, and then um, we punch it down. So we add the nutrients. We don't add the yeast just yet. We usually wait between 12 and 24 hours to add the yeast so that the grapes can get to the temperature of the winery um, because it, it also is important to have it at the right temperature. You can have a fermentation that it goes slower if it's colder and it will go sometimes faster if it's warmer, but we like to keep our winery at what, 75? About around, around 68 around 68 um, and then in the winter we'll sometimes bring it up a little bit higher but around 68 so that's where we're going to have the fermentation take place so we want to wait until the grapes get to that temperature before we add the yeast and uh, a lot of winemakers just use one specific yeast for reds or they'll use just one for cab nate likes to be a little bit um, of an artist on what he's doing and so we use quite a few different yeasts for all of our different varietals but then nate will decide how much of any particular yeast and sometimes we'll mix yeast in order to make um, certain characteristics come out in the wine. Um, so then we do that the next day and then that will start the fermentation. We do punch downs um, two to three times a day and that's with a big metal stick with a disc on the bottom with holes in it and we punch that down to as it ferments the skins push to the top and the juice falls to the bottom so we punch it down to mix it up push the skins back down so that we can get nice color extraction and then also to get the oxygen into the wine because it does need oxygen as well as it's fermenting. And then this last year, we made sure to test the fermentation process every day so that we could see how the progress was, was going. And then that way we can predict when we're going to be pressing. Um, a lot of times we'll wait until the CO2 levels have, have cut down before we start testing to that level. But this year we decided to just go ahead and test every day so that we could really see the rate at which each batch of wine was fermenting. And each bin sometimes will ferment at a different rate as well um, for whatever reason. Awesome, so we have a, oh man, that word. Um, we, uh, Patty, er, I see that Patty's hand is raised or that there's a button. So Patty, I'm gonna unmute you. Do you guys have a question? No, I don't think I raised my hand. Oh. But anyhow, hi. There's a little <laughs> thing on your picture that I says know, I hand it. raised. I so I was like, hand. oh, perfect. But, That's cool. But, but you know what? I, I really would like to just say one thing. Uh, Dre and Nate, I got a phone call today from Rich and Nancy Phillips. Oh, yay. Yeah. And so um, I told them about it, but I don't know if they would be able to do it. But they would say, well, so tell Nate and Dre hi. Oh, and thank doing you. Well. Awesome. Right. And we Good to see you guys. I love you guys too. I love you. Bye. <laughs> and then uh, Chuck asked, what are nutrients? All right, well, <laughs> can you guys tell my wife she earned her assistant winemaking title <laughs> because she knows what she's talking about? Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of you. Good job, baby. Thank Killed you. it. Oh. <laughs> So nutrients are what we think about to humans as vitamins. And so every part of this winemaking experience goes through um, its start of inception and forms the grape and goes through its maturity and everything else to that perfect time when it's ready to pick. And then as we go into fermentation, um, we come upon a, a time where this is a new phase of life. And a healthy vineyard, if you have an extremely healthy vineyard, you're not going to need as much nutrients in the vineyard to make a perfect wine. If you don't, then the winemaker needs to help it out. But no matter what, we give our wines the proper nutrients. So it's the same thing as you would think equivalent to giving vitamins to a human being. You need your B12s and your amino acids and your this and that. So with uh, nutrients comes the vitamins to have a healthy, cohesive fermentation. 
And with that, then you go through a beautiful fermentation. If you need a little more of this or that, diammonium phosphate, who knows, but this or that, it's, it's a beautiful, it's, it's a, uh, an enhanced way to help make sure the wine is healthy and beautiful and not um, deficient. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it just ensures that we have a nice, healthy fermentation. <laughs> okay. okay. Everybody, the fermentation expert now, you kind of know the basics of it. Um, those components are basically what you need to make anything ferment. Whether your results are going to be as good as a Vina Moto wine might be questionable, but you kind of know the basics. <laughs> Um, to get the whole process going. Um, and we're talking about Cabernet Sauvignon today. Um, why Cabernet? Why not another grape? Um, Cabernet Sauvignon is the most planted variety around the world. Um, why is that? Why do people want to plant Cabernet Sauvignon? Well, it's not even that old of a varietal. Um, the French, it is perceived, um, sometime in the 17th century, crossed two different grapes to make Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, Cabernet Franc, which you may be familiar with, it's a red, earthy grape, and Sauvignon Blanc, which is a white, bright, acidic grape. So they crossed those two grapes to make Cabernet Sauvignon. Why did they do that? What was the appeal there? Uh, Sauvignon Blanc has a lot of acid in it, and up until then, they weren't able to age their wines. So as soon as they introduced this acid component, they started finding out that in the cellar, these wines would go on and have another life, five years, 10 years, 15 years from now. And it was because of that acid, um, the wines can continue to be lively in the bottle. Um, another thing about Cabernet Sauvignon that makes it so special, I worked retail for a really long time. Uh, a question that I get asked most often is, what is your favorite wine? And it's really hard. Um, to answer that because there's so many wines in the world, but I usually try to boomerang that question and I'll say, well, what kind of wines do you like if they're looking for a recommendation? And nine times out of 10, somebody will say, I really love Cabernet Sauvignon. And I'd say, well, what is it about Cabernet Sauvignon that you like? And they're like, I don't know. It's just really smooth. It's just really, you know, it's got this um, kind of romantic quality to it. Um, the truth is Cabernet Sauvignon is a thick skinned grape. What does that mean when we say thick skinned grape? If you've ever taken a table grape, the next time you've got a grape, um, just there and you peel that skin off the table grape and just eat the skin off of that grape, that's where the tannins live. So just eat that. It's a little, it's bitter because that is the nature of tannins. And Cabernet Sauvignon has a very thick skin, unlike grapes like Grenache or Pinot Noir. So that means it has a lot of tannins in it. So what does that mean? That means it's got muscle, it's got power, it's kind of masculine in its, in its uh, characteristic. So that's where a lot of the artistry comes in. Sometimes it needs a little bit of Merlot or a little bit of Malbec or something to tone it down. Um, but that ageability is gonna make it transform and give it a life of its own. So the tannins in there can be very powerful, but by introducing small amounts of other grapes than that, we can really get a very well-rounded grape that can have longevity. Again, 10, 20, 30 years from now, um, that grape will continue to be interesting in there. It also is a great canvas for oak. So every time you take a wine and you put it in a barrel, an oak barrel, either a first generation, first generation means it's never been used before, a second generation barrel has had one wine before it, every time you use that barrel, it's gonna lose a little bit of its flavor, um, flavor or intensity on the wines. But uh, barrels will add components like vanilla, cedar, tobacco, spice, adds more layers and Cabernet is the perfect canvas for this because of those beautiful tannins in there. Uh, so Cabernet is a fun grape to play with. It's a fun grape to collect. It's one of those wines where maybe if you guys got a few bottles of Vina Moda 2016 Cabernet and you're drinking one now but then you opened up that bottle a year or two years from now, it's going to have a different personality because Cabernet can do that. It's capable of doing that. And so it's very romantic and it's kind of fun um, if you're into collecting wines uh, because every time you open it up, it's going to be a little bit different. It's going to have a little different characteristic. Um, and then again, those tannins, again, um, in any other capacity might be a little overpowering um, at all. And I thought, Nate and Dre, if you guys want to talk a little bit about what you guys did with that 2016 Cabernet, what other grapes you guys introduced 
in there to make that Cabernet Sing? Um, so first of all, we do typically blend our Cabernet with at least one other component. Um, the most common grape that people will blend with Cabernet is Merlot. And that's why you see like Opus One, they only sell Cabernet, but their vineyard has both Cabernet and Merlot and I think Mavet. And uh, Cab Franc. And Cab Franc. And so they're blending those things into their Cabernet. Um, and it just kind of depends on our blending components, but we don't ever expect one particular blending component to always go into our cab. And that's why we do our blending trials that you hear us talk about. We do that in January. So the wine at that point has already aged in barrel and we can really have a great idea of who it's going to be. Um, but I'll have Nate talk specifically about the 2016s because he actually has like a photographic memory for that. And I've already moved on to the 2018s. <laughs> so yeah, my question to everybody, I don't know, like I give maybe a show of hands or whatever. Who's drinking the 16 tonight? Oh, quite a few. Damn. Okay. So we we started out with the 2009. Um, oh my God, smooth sailor. I remember it being more tannic and and overbearing. Mo out there, wherever you are, I know I heard you say you're drinking the nine. Absolute smooth. Oh my God, I'm just absolutely loving on that wine. I know that we improve each year as as a winery and winemakers, and my whole staff improves each year, but. Oh my God, this 16 is a monster. I came after that nine and this thing is just huge, huge tannins, rich, deep. I can't wait to see what this thing's going to be like in another 10 years. I mean, this is, this is a wine that's going to hold up when you lay it in your cellar and you're wondering what wine do I lay down for a while and drink it, whatever happy moment, 16 is going to be the one because we were just drinking the 17 a couple nights ago. Dre's writing all the, uh, uh, tasting, tasting notes on it so um, we were just drinking that and I mean very bright full cherry very vibrant wine but oh my god this 16 I just came off the nine I'm like oh holy crap like I love you guys being a moda drinkers because like this takes a big person to drink this big wine so um do you remember what we blended into but okay yeah back to, back to the okay back to what we're going to um in this year, I do believe that a little bit of Petite Syrah, we don't make a Petite Verdot, but Petite Syrah, Petite Verdot, they dance a very close dance together. Um, but a little bit of Petite Syrah, and I do believe maybe a pinch of Merlot went into this as well. So. That would be my recollection as well. I don't remember the exact percentages, but, um, but we did put a little bit of that in there. And that's just to make it a little bit more approachable. And another thing that we do with our cabs, a lot of times Cabernet are... Uh, when they're younger, when you first open them, the tannins are just really ripping big and, and it's so bone dry um, that it really dries out your mouth. And so you have to lay it down in, in order to truly enjoy it or have more than a glass or anyway for myself. And one of the things that Nate does is, first of all, we make sure to let the grapes stay on the vine until they're fully ripened. And those flavors, as I was talking about earlier, as we're testing in the vineyard, we make sure that those flavors are fully there rather than picking them early where a lot of cabs are picked around 23 and a half to 24 and a half bricks and ours are picked closer to what 27 yeah we run 27 5 28 um, around that so um it makes our cabs have a little bit higher alcohol there at the end or not the end but throughout the process but it allows us to really get those those full fruit flavors in there and then also we leave just a hint of residual sugar and uh, it's just usually about 0 0.01, maybe 0 0.02, yeah, about 0 0.01 percent residual sugar. But um, but most cabs are done in the negative numbers, and so one of the reasons we do that is so that you can drink it a little bit earlier, and then it really affects the mouthfeel. And Nate's signature as a winemaker is to have a really smooth, long finish. And one of the reasons we're able to do that with such a young wine is leaving just a hint of that residual sugar and letting the fruit fully ripen. I love the, the way that that wine tastes. Oh, hello, I hear something. Um, I love the way you guys describe the way that the wine is tasting. I know everybody here is a professional uh, wine drinker. Uh, if you want to be a professional wine taster, there's a little process that we go through. Um, and the first one that almost everybody skips is to look at the wine. So with Cabernet, we're looking at a lot of red fruit. Um, you can hold it up to a piece of white paper, have a piece of white paper behind that, and if you can, even get a little globe, 
You can see how translucent it is or whether it's opaque, how dark it is. But with Cabernet, we're always looking for those red, red fruit qualities. Um, sometimes if you have an older Cabernet, it might have a little amber halo around it. That's just telling you that that wine has had a little bit of time in the bottle to get interesting. So um, with Cabernet, we want to look at the wine first. That gives you a lot of information about kind of preparing your palate, about what you're about to try. Um, and then you want to smell the wine. I know we all do a little one of these right here. This kind of releases, makes you look cool at parties. Um, but also if you do that, it'll really kick up the aromatics. And then when you go to smell the wine, do not be shy. Get your beak all the way in there and just smell that because there's a lot to offer, especially with Cabernet, um, because you're gonna have some little notes of those other grapes. You're gonna have some notes from the um, barrel if there's any barrel time. And then you're gonna have all of the other interesting things that might come age. So you wanna look at the wine, you wanna get your beak in there, get a good whiff of that. Um, your sense of smell is going to inform your taste buds. They're very highly connected. So when you're looking at the wine, when you smell the wine and you're getting a bunch of the fruit components and then you taste it, um, all three of those things together are going to bring you to the easiest part of tasting wine, which is the conclusion. Do I like this wine? Do these things make sense? Is this wine a balanced wine? What is a balanced wine? A balanced wine should have some sugar, some sweetness to it. It should have some acid to it. It, have, it should have some tannin to it. Um, and then it'll have alcohol or body. Those are somewhat interchangeable, but body's kind of the overall uh, encompassing that. So a balanced wine, doesn't have any component that's more than another. Um, to think of it in a really simple term, think about a glass of lemonade. If you've ever had a glass of lemonade that had too much lemon juice and not enough sugar, it's harsh, it's not refreshing, it's just too tart. If you've had a glass of lemonade that's got too much sugar and not enough lemon juice, now it's just sugar water. What you really want is you want everything to be in harmony. So what we're looking for in balanced wine, we're gonna look at the wine, what is that color? That's telling me a little bit about the fruit component. What are the smells? Am I smelling any oak in there? Am I smelling, what type of fruits um, are coming across? Um, and then we're gonna taste that, and then we're gonna see what is that balance? Is this harsh? Um, is it harsh with alcohol? Sometimes acid and alcohol can be confused. Um, acidity is usually the brightness of that wine, it should be lively, no matter what, no matter how old it is, she'll have some life to it. Um, if it's kind of flabby, that is the word that gets tossed around, that means there's not enough acid in there. Um, the fruit should be present, it shouldn't be overly sweet, but the fruit should always be there. Um, and that's a balanced wine. So yeah, doing this at parties is really great, um, but what you're doing is you're kicking up those aromatics, you're introducing some oxygen into that, and it's really adding to the way you taste the wine. Um, because it's going to let your um, air, that all the nose on that come through on a Cabernet. Um, what makes Cabernet special as well, particularly in California, um, as we mentioned, it's the most planted grape in the world. But California is a warm climate. Uh, the other places that uh, it's most widely grown are France and Chile, and those are cooler climates. What does that mean? In a warm climate, the grapes are gonna produce more natural sugar. So they're gonna get really, really ripe. So think about just getting a perfectly roadside strawberry, that natural sugar that's in there. Um, California can produce this really beautiful ripe fruit. In France, where it's a little bit cooler, or Chile, um, it's the, the fruit doesn't get quite uh, as much natural sugar in it. Um, so it's gonna have more minerality and it's gonna have higher acid. We need the sugar to get the higher alcohol. So those wines also tend to be a little bit lower in body. And when we talk about French Cabernet, we're talking about Bordeaux. Um, that is typically how it is grown there. You're gonna see lots of Cabernet, but it's almost always married with Merlot, which is Merlot and Cabernet are kind of like um, maybe conflicted brothers or a little older brother, younger brother rivalry, um, but they go great together in the bottle. And that's what's so special about California Cabernet. Uh, California in itself has over a hundred different soil types. So in France, very limited soil types, it tends to be sandy limestone, but in California, it's an agricultural mecca. So you can have Cabernet all over California 
that's going to be different because of the different soil types and then you have climate that will introduce either more heat or more cool climates and will transform that grape into something else and where Andrea and Nate have made the Foothills Cabernet um, I thought they could tell you a little bit about what the Foothills um, does to a Cabernet grape and how it makes it so distinct from other Californian Cabernet. Absolutely. So um, you don't find a lot of Cabernets here in the Foothills the way you find them in Napa, where, you know, typically you're going to find more Barbera and Zinfandel and things like that. And mainly that's because here in the Foothills, the Cabernet tends to be super cherry, um, very fruit forward without a lot of that herbaceousness. And so it's not, it doesn't come across as a typical Cabernet. And so a lot of people shy away from it as thinking it's uh, not as complex as a Napa Cab. And so people who are really big cab drinkers don't typically go for what is typically looked at as um, a common flavor profile for Foothills Cabs. We're very fortunate in that um, our Cabernet is grown exactly perfectly the way that Nate would want it. And, and if it wasn't just the, the right soil, if it wasn't uh, facing the sun in just the right way, if it wasn't on a hillside, if it, you know, all of those components didn't come together to make it the perfect cab for what Nate wants it to be, then we wouldn't even make a Cabernet. Um, so the, we've had two different vineyards of Cabernet um, that we've used throughout the years. One is Brawl Mountain Vineyards. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of them. They have a tasting room in town. And then the other one is their neighbor, and it's just a very small vineyard. It's what, like one acre? One acre of planted grapes, and it's the same exact clone. They got the clippings from Brawl Mountain to plant it, and it's up on Pennsylvania Gulch. Is it on Pennsylvania? Mm -hmm. Yeah on Pennsylvania Gulch, and they're wine club members of ours, um, Jim and Celeste Ornelas, and so we were able to get just roll at first. Once they planted theirs, we were able to get both, and then now we're just uh, getting the, the grapes from the Ornelas vineyard um, because Brol is using all of their grapes for their own winery at this point, which is why the cab is so limited at this point. It's one acre. Nate makes sure it's cropped to where it's um, three tons or less per acre. We typically get about a ton and a half only of Cabernet at this point and um, it's all organically grown um, and tended exactly the way that Nate wants it to be um, so we end up with I think four three to four barrels well like two two to three barrels oh, okay. two to and three then barrels. also shout out to Mark Skinfield he knows how to plant great Cabernet so yeah. Vina Moda is producing really fantastic Cabernets of structure and balance not just red cherry fruit and that's all you get so shout out to Mark got to Got to give that love because he planted both vineyards and both fantastic. Um, so ours is able to have more structure and it does have that herbaceousness to it that people tend to look for in Cabernet, but it's more of like a fresh picked jalapeno um, than straight up green pepper, uh, which I think makes it unique. And um, it's, I think, super well balanced uh, for a Cabernet. And it, like I said, the 2009 Cabernet was my first favorite cab. Um, I wasn't really a big cab fan prior to that, but the way that, that those vineyards are grown, and um, I'll have Nate actually talk a little bit about the specifics of the vineyard, because I was just saying it's on a hillside and mm -hmm. facing the sun, but you know it more intimately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to achieve a little bit more of the herbaceous qualities in the vineyard, um, what we look for is not just, uh, most people think we're in California, southern exposure the sun comes by and you're just baking all day with grapes if you're wanting to gain more complexity in the grape you need to do something that's getting those morning lumens in the light and it's more of a straight direct east facing with even a slight north to it and then you're going to get a little bit more herbaceous qualities a little bit more minerality um, soaking up because the fruit on a south facing slope doesn't just overtake everything so depending on what you're growing, what you're wanting out of your vineyard, that's what I would look at if you're wanting Cabernet, because Cabernet needs to be well-structured, well-balanced. You can't just get one-dimensional Cabernet. It's just, mm -hmm. it's not cab to its, its truest quality. But uh, if you're looking for that, that's what I would say is if you're growing a vineyard is look for those. And if you're buying grapes for a winemaker coming in as a vineyard or whatever, um, look for those if you're growing Cabernet. But uh, 
yeah, there's a ton of other grapes. So yeah, we could go on in this story forever, but we're focusing on cabs. So that's where I'll stop. And then I have a sample here. Um, Nate runs labs on all of our wines. Sorry, there's a bug on here. Um, and one of the wineries, the people that he's just started making wine for, we're getting ready to bottle some cab for them. So I have their um, actual lab results here for their 2017 Cabernet. And, and this is a winery that we're only doing Napa fruit um, for all of their cab. So one of the newest, shout out to them too, because we're shouting to everybody the Naragi family. So um, they're the next people coming up and making wine for them. And this is their cab that we're going to be bottling for them in a couple of weeks. Yeah. So um, yeah. I just wanted to introduce a little bit of what, when we run the labs or we have the labs run, what it is that we're looking for. So I'm sure you can't see that, but I'll read it out to you. Um, so uh, the free SO2 parts per million and then the total SO2 parts per million. And so we talk a lot about um, our wines having lower sulfites than typical reds. And so that's what we're looking at as the free SO2. So this one's had a free SO2 at 26 parts per million, and then total SO2 is 95 parts per million. And then uh, the TA, which is the titratable acidity. And so that's where we're looking at the acid profile. So that has a 5.51. We also look at the pH and we want the acids and the pH to be balanced. Um, so the pH is 3.8. Volatile acidity, and that is when the wine starts to turn to vinegar. So you want a very low number on that. And so this is a 0.58 excellent number. Anyone or any winery who allows their wine to get too high of a VA, then it's illegal to sell that as wine. You have to turn that into balsamic vinegar or some, some sort of vinegar. And so a really good winemaker would not ever allow that to happen. Um, we look at the malic acid, and this is a negative 0.1. Lactic acid is 1.1. Um, what is that? Glucose. Okay, glucose fructose. Okay, so that's the uh, residual, sugar, residual sugar is 0.7. And then the uh, ethanol, which is the alcohol, is 14.35%. And so I'll have Nate talk a little bit about what he looks for in that. We won't geek out too much just because that is a lot of science, but. Yeah, honestly, uh, from my, from what I look at, I do look at the numbers, I analyze the numbers, but it's all about the flavor. I want my people to have the best flavor, and I can see a pH getting high, and so many winemakers would say, oh, that's flabby or fatty wine there, but I'm not going to throw a bunch of acid at it to just drop that to give you more acid for a perceived brightness when there's already so much depth in the wine anyway so a lot of the numbers I love the the Davis classes that I did everything that I've done there and they taught so much about getting your numbers perfect and balanced but there's so much greatness to just flavor and you guys you you care about the flavor you want it to taste fantastic you want it to last to be smooth rich but you don't want anything to jump out and claw but you don't care what this piece of paper says. You want it to be good. So that's where I say I love numbers. I love to see it, but also I love to see the smiles on your faces, especially like at our wine club and all the parties we have together where I get to see you guys and uh, it's, it's joy. So it's bliss. I love numbers and I read them and I do what I have to do and I run all the tests, but that's what I want to see, smiles and hanging out with my people soon hopefully fantastic i love having all that information and i love that dre mentioned the jalapeno um that is in your cab um all cabernet has what they call pyrazines in it and pyrazines happen in all fruit um, it's nature's way of keeping the squirrels and the birds away it's a little bit bitter and the most obvious indicator of something that has pyrazines in it is a little bit of green pepper a jalapeno pepper in there so if you guys have your cabernet no matter what cabernet hopefully you're drinking the vino moda cabernet see if you can pick up on any of that pepper um, that dre was discussing um, but it's always there um, and cabernet holds on to pyrazines uh, more than any other grape uh, the cabernet that you'll get from chile and argentina has the most prominent pyrazines of any Cabernet in the world. So here in Cal 
where I say here in California, I'm not in California, <laughs> there in California, um, a lot because there's so much fruit presence there and the body tends to be a lot higher, they're not as pronounced, but it's a really fun thing to indicate um, in a wine. And if you've ever done anything fun like a blind tasting, um, it's a dead giveaway that you're drinking Cabernet or you're drinking something uh, of that nature because those pyrazines are there. But pyrazines will show up in fruit that's under ripe and then as it gets ripe, it'll t tend to die off. But Cabernet just holds on to that a um, little bit of pepper component uh, to it as well. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about some of the other places that make Cabernet. We did touch on South America being a warm climate, um, but they're in California. Um, let's talk about the, wine, the way the wine tastes. We all have wine and we've all been drinking it, so everybody should have a nice loose tongue now uh, to see what's going on there. Uh, but in California, there, we're looking at red fruit and purple fruit typically. So um, cherries and every type of cherry usually comes across in different types of Cabernet. It might be dark cherries, it might be bright cherries, it might be Kirsch, which is like a really concentrated kind of almost cherry cordial or cherry liqueur. Um, currants come across really strongly in California Cabernet. It could be black currants or red currants where they're really tight berries and they're really bright. Uh, blackberries come, along, uh, come across really strongly in California Cabernet. So everybody take a minute if, you have, if you're able to, if you're not cooking dinner, and see if you can get any of those red fruit characteristics or any of the purple fruit characteristics. Um, I talked a little bit about blind tasting. Um, a lot of times, if anybody has seen the documentary Psalm on Netflix, there's a gentleman on there that likes to go on about tennis balls, and he drives everybody nuts talking about the tennis balls. And it's because there's a finite amount of things, if you're trying to identify things in wine. Nobody's expecting you to come up with off-the-wall things like four-day-old watermelon or... Um, uh, a, a peach from a vineyard um, in Washington or etc. Um, it's really very simple and when we're talking about red wine it's always red fruit, uh, blue fruit, and purple fruit. It's always those three categories are the most dominant characteristics and with Cabernet think about red fruit. So you're thinking about those cherries and those kirsch and those currants um, and then underlying blackberry notes usually in California because the fruit is so ripe there. So see how much of those fruit components you guys can get in there. And then any indicators of a barrel will have things like cedar and tobacco and vanilla and spice. And sometimes they're very subtle, but that's the beauty of Cabernet. And that's why we're having this class today is that you'll have all these different layers and Cabernet will really marry with those things um, in a really beautiful way so that no component is overpowering the rest of the wine. So I'm hoping all of you are getting able, are getting a chance to taste your wine and see what kind of fruits you guys are getting out of it. Um, if you're able to chat and if Jess, you can handle it. If anybody wants to type out what the um, fruits they're getting out of that 2016 Vina Mona Cab are. Um, or we I can unmute here. them. If, you can, if anyone wants to talk about it, just raise your hand and Jess will unmute you. Or unmute you or talk in the box. I see my little chat box going down here, but I oh, don't Carol. know what I'm doing oh, either. So. <laughs> Um, Carol, so you are hey unmuted now. Hey guys, oh. I, I had a quick question about uh, the winemaking. We, we've talked a little bit about blending. Uh, I think we said something about blending Merlots. Talked a little bit about um, changing the acidity of the wine. So how does blending work? Is that something that's done uh, in a reaction to something or is it only done once at the beginning? Or you, you get my question? Yes. Yes. So I'll, I'll take this one. Um, we age the wine all the way till about two and a half to three months before bottling. And so we've gotten pretty much the entire uh, uh, use out of our barrels. You're pretty much set at what the wine is gonna be at that point. So it, we taste all the wines, we see what's any flaws if we can pick out, It's it's, Bad to say, instead of sitting back and saying, oh, beautiful wine, we love you, you're so great, we instantly go and find any flaws that the wine has. And we pick it apart, literally. We do. And anything that's not perfect, we say, how can we fix this? We look, I make a lot of varietals, we make a lot of varietals at Vinamoda, so I have a lot of blending components. So when we start to pull out piece and, and put little... Uh, 
parts together, then that's where the beauty comes out in the wine. And it starts, it's, it's a laborious effort. Everybody would normally think that we're drinking a ton of wine. It's like, ooh, yeah, a little this, a little that. We do do that, but we do several, 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 several trials. Usually at and, least five different times. Yeah, and we try and exhaust everything that we could possibly do to that wine. And then we can check it off. It doesn't wake me up in the middle of the night saying, if I only would have tried this, we could have maybe had that beautiful wine. So it's just a lot of trial and error and being consistent and trying everything we possibly can and trying to create the perfect wine for you guys. And honestly, at the end of every blending trial, I sit back and I say, good job. We did the very best we could possibly do with what we had given to us that year. And yeah, it's, it's great. Our whole staff gets involved in it. We bring people, our closest friends, wine club members, closest friends in occasionally and say, Hey, as the general public, what do you taste? What is this to you? How do you perceive this? Because sometimes we can get lost in our own head and go down that rabbit hole. And we're so far past what that wine should have been. So um, we love blending trials. It's one of our greatest times, but it's also, it's, it's deep. It's hard. It's not, it's not this beautiful world of, yes, we just drink a ton of wine. It's, we really get deep in it. And really criticizing our lovely creations is tough, but it's something that we absolutely have to do. And, uh, Nate and I have such similar palettes that it's important to bring other people in. We usually do the first um, at least the first two, just the two of us. And then we start bringing people in so that we can really get an idea of the direction we're going with the wine and make sure that we aren't getting lost in our own palates. Um, we want it to be approachable to everyone and not just to us. And then during that is when we start coming up with the blends for the Venus and the Phoenix. So uh, prior to the blending trials, we don't typically start with the Phoenix or the Venus. We start with everything else. And then we can just really, by smelling and tasting things, we can see which wines are going to work well together. And sometimes one year, two wines will go great together. One year, Grenache and Merlot were like catfighting siblings. They were terrible. Like we couldn't even put them near each other. And then the next year, they worked really well together. So every year, it's a little bit different. So we can't just rely on a, on a formula or on a recipe or something like that. It and is then so also... Different. Just because I'm so immersed in it right now and I'm so deep up in it in bottling of this year, 2018. So all the people here, I, I love seeing all your faces. It's so great. You guys have been such great supporters. This is the epic year, guys. This is the one, like 2018. Oh, my God. 13 was my best year ever. I'd never seen a better year. 18. Uh, it's, it's amazing, amazing. Thing. So our new Venus blend. I can't quit drinking it. It's in the tank. It's in bottle shock. We've sent it through two filter cycles. I can't quit yeah, drinking it. Um, I know most with me because she's with me. We work together every day. She's my right hand. Whoa, man. And uh, we drink Venus all the time because it is, but then we are like, what should we drink next? Phoenix, the new Phoenix blend. It is ridiculous. So Across the board, 2018 is what we're doing right now. Oh, my God. Um, I can't wait for you to taste them. Sorry to, like, I know we're talking about cab, but <laughs> holy crap. Our 18s are going to. Talking about wine. Talking about wine. It all counts. Yeah. Well, and what we do during that time, during the blending trial, um, I keep a notebook. And we have these little squares of paper to, that go underneath the glasses as we're doing the blends. Nate has has graduated cylinders and we're measuring it out. And for every 10 milliliters, that equals one barrel. So we have to really measure it out very specifically so that we know exactly what it's gonna end up being like in the big um, in the big format. And then I keep a notebook, I don't have it here with me, but I keep a notebook and then I write down the number of blends we've tried and then I make notes. Sometimes it's like, tastes like vomit. Sometimes it's, you know, it, this is a step in the right direction, but we'll end up sometimes, especially with the blends like Phoenix, um, sometimes, upwards of 40 or 50 different blends that we've tried to get it just right. So there's a lot of artistry that goes into it and intuition, but then also just a lot of trial and error. And with the cabs, usually we have it done in less than 10 
because we don't want to go too far away from the actual varietal specific characteristics. Yeah. I can't speaking, go down the road. Speaking of calves, um, just got a question about what is the minimum percentage of cab do you need in a wine to call it a cab? Which 75%. Is, yeah, 75%. Yeah. Yeah, and that can go with any, any varietal. We very rarely push it that far. Yeah. We really want to keep it to be pretty varietal specific. Yeah, we're rarely more than 10% of any other few components. That law got introduced uh, in California in the 70s because at the time, um, a very large wine company uh, owned by the Franzia brothers were making their jug and box wine and putting Cabernet, Chardonnay, Merlot on the box with very little of those varieties um, inside of it. And Charlie Barra, who is the king of Mendocino wines, their wines have always been organic. He recently passed away in the last year, but he did a lot for California wine legislature. Um, he went to Ronald Reagan, who was governor at the time, and said, I wanna get this law changed to make it so that you have to have at least 75% of the varietal in the bottle. And Ronald Reagan told Charlie, uh, I see that you're a registered Democrat, you switched to Republican, and this bill will get signed, and it was done and done. Uh, and so ever since then, that has been a law in California. This impacted Franzia to such an extent, and to deter Charlie from getting this law passed, the Franzia brothers actually blew up Charlie's car <laughs> um, in retaliation to get him to stop from making that law change. So that was in the 70s, and that's kind of when the wine boom first started in California, but it really gave all of the independent winemakers the advantage they needed um, so that people knew that the box stuff that said Chardonnay tasted different from actual Chardonnay for a reason, and so um, it was really important. And he was an amazing guy, he lived to be 97. I believe when he passed away last um, last summer, um, but yeah, he's responsible for getting a lot of these kind of guidelines made, and those guidelines apply in California, but they don't necessarily apply in Washington and Oregon and other states in the United States. So just know that that's that a California sense. rule. Oh, do you guys see in somebody? Oh, Nate's just checking out who all. Yeah, here. I was like, Nick, what's up, dude? I haven't seen you in forever. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to see all the peeps out there. Love you guys. Do you guys have more questions about your Vinamoto wines or questions for me? I don't, I have tidbits for you. I do want to throw out that the Thursday before Labor Day is National Cabernet Day. So make sure that you have some Cabernet. Make sure you have some Vinamoto Cab before then. I'm sure they'll be able to provide you some, but uh, we do have a National Cabernet Day and that is um, as we're heading into our first kind of end of summer, heading into fall and kind of red wine weather. Um, so I wanted to put that on everybody's radar. Um, but any more questions? For oh, I actually um, earlier was going to mention when Sheila was saying that Cabernet is the most grown grape in the world. And I actually have the statistics we do every year on January 10th. We have to submit our grape crush inquiry report findings to the California um, State Agriculture Department. And then they put together this report that's like hundreds of pages long. And I love getting that report and just kind of geeking out on it. And I left it at the tasting room. But I wanted to show you there's a chart of the grapes that are grown in California and which ones are the most popular. Cabernet and Chardonnay are two of the biggest. And then, um, and even in Calaveras, yeah, it's, it's the, one of the largest uh, number of grapes grown. But um, one of the things that I was talking to Sheila about when we were getting ready to do this class is the movie Sideways really ruined Merlot um, for several years. And even now in the tasting room, when we have a Merlot on the lineup, a lot of people refuse to taste it because they're just like, oh, I don't do Merlot. You know, it really worked a number on Merlot. But I don't know if everyone knows or if very many people know in the book, it was supposed to be Cabernet Sauvignon. And then the actor, Paul Giamatti, when he was trying to say that line about if they come in and order Cabernet Sauvignon, I'm out of here. And he kept not pronouncing it the way a wine snob would pronounce Cabernet Sauvignon. And so they just decided to say Merlot because he could say that. And I wonder if that movie if would have- cab would be damaged because of it. Yeah, because it is the most popular grape in the world. So 
um, I've always wondered that. And I thought it would be a fun thing to ask the class. Like, do you think if that had been, if that movie had said Cabernet instead of Merlot, do you think it would have maybe not necessarily affected whether you liked it, but do you think it would have had the same impact that it had on Merlot? Because it really did devastate Merlot for over a decade. It still struggles. Yeah, yeah we does. really have to mm -hmm. twist people's arms to taste the Merlot. And our Merlot is so complex and deep. And we have uh, wine club members that uh, the note on their account is never Merlot. Um, okay. And then, so. so sorry, I have to jump okay. in real quick. So for all my peeps out there, I see so many of you. I love it. Um, talking about Merlot right now, I got Merlot out of Napa. Ridiculous, stupid price, super cheap. Um, out of this super uh, glorious vineyard and they sold so much merlot but there was such a glut of it that the birds were just eating it so they called up and they were sending out feelers so i got together with all my people as many people as i knew and we bought up 10 tons of napa merlot and we got it for just the best a price really like, great price and um <laughs> it is phenomenal like so we're talking about merlot and yeah most merlot pretty good it's not it's not cabernet cab is just such a more robust beast but this merlot i can't wait for you guys to try ridiculous so, so 2019 yes. merlot yeah yep. it's 2019 so yeah you guys won't see it for a little while but it's i couldn't believe it i don't normally go to napa all the way there for merlot but it, really? it, yeah and it came out perfection so we have a couple of questions. Um, so I'm going to unmute Peter, and he has a question for you guys. So Peter, go ahead. I think this is, might be for Sheila the most, but love to hear from, from Nate and Dre, Dre too. But um, I got a chance to taste some French wines with some really Napa winemakers, and they kept talking about Britannomyces. And they, they hated it, but it sounded like it was pretty popular in Europe. Something you have to deal with in the foothills. And, and what is the relationship between that and Cab? Um, so it's it's something that... Yeah, Sheila. Oh, oh okay, sorry. Oh, no, that's what, you guys go first. I'll follow no, up. No, you go, Sheila. You go. Because Andrea went to France, so I'm interested to hear what her answer is about... Go ahead, okay. Andrea. Okay, so it naturally occurs um, and can actually infect an entire winery's barrel program. So it's something that they're even training dogs uh, who can detect brutanomyces in barrels. And then they're acting almost like drug dogs where they go in and they can detect the brutanomyces so that they can remove those barrels or at least have them in a different area because they can um, transfer in the air. Beforehand. So, um, the Britannomyces a lot of times is called the noble rot. And so there are a lot of wineries that want a, a certain amount of Britannomyces in their program. And so they don't want it to be in all of their barrels because that would be too much and it might, um, you know, really take everything over. But they want it in a small percentage of their barrels so that then when they blend everything together, it has that little bit of Britannomyces. And so um, it has kind of a barnyard smell and I don't know that the flavor is barnyard but it definitely adds like an old world kind of uh, cellar older wood, older wood kind of barnyard uh, quality to it and when I was in France yes they are very very proud of their botanomyces programs um, and usually they would have specific areas in their underground cellars where they were aging and they would have rooms where the barrels that had Britannomyces were kept in those rooms and they did not use the same equipment in that room versus the other rooms because they didn't want to spread the Britannomyces to the other barrels um, but they did want to go ahead and continue with that with having that introduced into their wines. We, I am not a fan of Britannomyces. But also Britannomyces is also a noble thing as well so in fine wines with a little bit of it it, it adds layers so i mean it adds layers but too much it takes away things. so in our program we're super clean we have zero where we run super clean and that's but not our style it's not our style but in fact, there is a nobility to it it's absolutely necessary for making of dessert wines because you will get um, an introduction of those sugars. And so what happens is that 
uh, Britannomyces says the noble rot will actually deplete the content of the water in the grape so that you end up with too much sugar. So what happens is you have an imbalance of yeast versus sugar and you end up with a sweeter end result. Or um, for anybody here who likes to drink funky, funky beers, um, a nice sour beer a lot of times, those beer dorks love Brett. They love to have it on their beers um, because it adds all this kind of funky, like you said, barnyard or like Greek characteristics. So I think it's its own character and its own, um, it has its place. It's, I mean, this is old world and a lot of it, the presence of it, it cannot, it's kind of like a Portuguese sherries where um, it's such a specific climate, soil, um, grape combination that it's not going to naturally occur anywhere. You really need the perfect storm of components in order to get that. And so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a sense of pride because it has a lot to do with where they're making wine. Just like sherry, you know, a lot of wine, you know, internationally, you want to like have your wines in a cellar, downwards dark, and you want to protect the wines, but in Portugal and Spain, where they're making sherries, they open up the windows and they invite the floor, they invite the bacteria to get in their barrels um, because they can do that there because of their um, how close they are to oceans. And so, yeah, it's definitely characteristic of that. You see it a lot in, like I said, beer guys are trying to reproduce that all the time. And then as far as Noble Rot and the dessert wines that you get from that, um, dessert wines, uh, the grapes really require a specific weather pattern and climate change at a very specific time that hasn't been happening consistently in the past seven to eight years. So we're finding that dessert wines um, in themselves are not um, as prevalent as they used to be. So in France, it would be Sautern. Your Sauternes are reducing in frequency because they cannot get the right conditions to get that noble rot to happen. So um that's a fantastic question but yeah very specific the, so um when you, if you're looking for wines that have that you look for words like garig um like red wines you'll see it a lot in rhone um wines in southern france will have a lot of that kind of barnyard funky quality to it um that's specific to that area but um i'm a lover of all wines um there's plenty of wine that's terrible but i think everybody does something uh, well in their own backyard. Even in Oklahoma, we have some native grapes that I think um, they're indigenous to North America. They cannot plant good Cabernet here. They cannot plant good Pinot Noir, just about everything that you've ever heard of here, but they can plant some things like Chamberson and Norton um, because you just have to find the right grape that's gonna thrive in the right climate. So I think that's, yeah, fantastic question. Any more questions? Um, so we had one from Rich Winslow. He was asking about, it's not a cab related question, but it's still kind of pertaining to what we have coming out from Vina Moda next. But he is asking about our Moved. And so uh, we have good news and for the, the pure Moved lovers, maybe some bad news, but we still have the 17, but I'm gonna pass it over to Nate and Dre. There was a plane flying overhead, so I muted us. Sorry about that. Um, I'll let Nate talk about that. Okay, so what's it, which more bed are you talking about? Just more bed in general. Okay, so have have you had the 2017 more bed yet? No. Oh. 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 <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. So um, 2017 more bed, absolutely gorgeous. Of course. Uh, I was doing Pinot Noir for since 2014. I've been doing Pinot. I've been going to the Russian River. Had some really good close contacts we'd made there, and uh, did 14, 15, 16 Pinot. Um, but then that vineyard got bought out by some bazillionaire corporation, whatever. So that went off the table. So I said, "All right, I'm going to go ahead and." explore what we have in our country because honestly driving to the russian river four hours waiting in the vineyard helping load up and then having to haul all the way back then sort all day killing me so 
love Pinot, love all that. I have enough that we can drink Pinot for the next few years. So, uh, but we did more ved and there's a vineyard out mountain ranch way out tucked back ridiculous place, but it's all grazed by sheep and organically organic run around, yeah. organic, <laughs> organic, ridiculous. I got to drive back. Like it, it's a crazy place, but, um, this Morved, it's gorgeous. It's absolutely beautiful. Layers upon layers, silky, smooth, soft. ML really took in it. So you get this little butter cream over it, but then this spiciness of Morved. So to me, it's, it's our Pinot of the foothills because it's got all the herbaceous layers, all the beautiful, all the Pinot characters. The meaty quality. To meaty, it a little yeah. Bit. I mean, forest floor, um, everything you'd want, mushroomy a little bit, but it is, it's a Pinot on steroids because we're in the foothills and we're just a little bit hotter and bigger than what they grow on the coast. So, um, right. that's the 2017. And that's the 17, but then the 18, I wanted to do more vet as a varietal, but it ended up going to the new Venus. Oh, so okay. when I talked to you guys earlier about like, you can't wait for this new stuff to come up. The new 2018 is going to the Venus and it's, it's ridiculous. I can't wait for you guys to try it. And then we didn't so get any happy. in 2019 um, and we probably won't get any in 2020. Yeah, 2020 so if you're a Maved lover, um, we have one bottle of 09 Maved in the tasting room that Nate just found in storage. Um, Chuck A.B., the lover yeah, of that. Yeah, Chuck's the dude. Um, and then we have a good amount of the 2017 Maved left. It's on our current lineup. And then we won't, we won't be doing another straight Maved. We probably won't fresh any again until probably 2022 at the earliest so if you're a Maved lover grab that up now we have another question we're shifting now from Maved to Syrah which is another mm -hmm. one of our signatures wines here at Vina Moda um, but we had a question what is your favorite Syrah that you have made and that they can still purchase uh, my well Gosh, it's hard to say. The 2013 Syrah is my favorite. Um, I don't think we currently have any in the tasting room. We did have some, and then we sold it all. Um, but Nate can always dig some out of storage. I'm volunteering him <laughs> for, for something that I don't know if he's able to do right now since we're in the middle of bottling. But um, the 2013 Syrah is absolutely 17. my favorite. The new 17, yes, is also, I'm working on the tasting notes for that. So we've had that a few times recently. Oh, and oh, okay. Uh, it also just won best of class at the San Francisco Chronicle. So um, that's pretty exciting that uh, a bunch of judges decided that it was the best Syrah in its class. Um, it's very, very, very nice. It's um, when I drink side by side the 2016, which is on the current lineup, and the 2017, the 17 definitely is a little bit younger, obviously, being in bottle for a year less. Um, but it does have some wonderful layers. And typically when I'm having that, um, I'll pour a glass and then I wait until the next day to have the rest of it because then I get to really experience what it's going to be like after it's opened up for a little while or laid down for a little while. Um, and then that makes it just even more approachable and I can really detect all of its subtle layers. Um, but overall, my my favorite is the 2013. I have a fondness for the 2011 as well because that's the wine that we were drinking when Nate proposed to me so it also uh, has a fond place in my heart but um Nate what is your favorite of the Syrahs? He says 16 or 17 are his two favorites of the Syrah um and I don't know if you guys know this but Nate does work with a lot of different varietals between Vina Moda and all the other wineries he makes for and Syrah is his favorite varietal to work with. So um, he gets to have a lot of fun with that. Syrah is one of my favorite grapes, right. very underrated. Right. It's gorgeous. It's a Rhone varietal. So if you like Cabernet as kind of like your muscle, old world grapes, Syrah makes sense for the same reasons. It's got spice and fruit and plums. And uh, I absolutely love Syrah. I think and it's, it's always so decadent and luscious. And, and another thing is we talked about earlier about um, blending trials. 
Sarab plays well with others. Yeah. So when we are doing our blending trials, we go through and we taste all the wines and we see who plays well with others. It's like children on the playground. Who plays well with others and then who does not? Some do not. Barbera does not play. Does not play. It's not a it's not a friendly child. It never plays with anybody else. Have you guys um, done a GSM blend like 30, 30? Our new Venus is a GSM. Yeah. It's like 30, yeah. 30, 30, 30, nice. It's not exactly. No, 30, no, it's not no. all that. It's more Grenache, or it's, it's more Syrah, more red equal, and then uh, Grenache backing. Yeah, love it. Yeah, it's one of my favorite combos of wine. Those kind of own style blends. Yeah, but Barbera does not play well with others. I make for Villa Vallecito Sagrantino. Usually does not play well with others as well, but That's certain fun. ones like Syrah, I love Syrah because petite Syrah. Syrah, Petite Syrah, oh my God, Petite Syrah is the most giving. Like she's such a mother in the in the winery. So we had two questions that kind of go similarly. Um, Pat asked, "Can you give some advice on what wines to save?" and how do you know and then don and nick are asking so do you ever put in or do you guys ever put a note out when your wine has peaked i usually go off the app that is a general guideline from the wine specter spectator but it would be nice to know when is like the ideal time to drink our wine so um on our tasting notes as well as in the wine club notes that are that we send out on every single one of those in the wines, we say drink now or cellar up to X number of years. And so we try to make sure to tell you that from the very beginning so that, and that's hard obviously to keep track of unless you maybe write it on the bottle or something. Um, honestly, with us using screw caps, our wines last a really good long time. Um, for those of you um, that were at the dinner that we had in February, the Bevians were there, um, we were able to have our 2007 Viognier and um that had been in bottle well over 10 years and it was phenomenal um so and that's an 07 white wine viognier sierra foothills it was the best of class that year too but it was gorgeous yes and then we had um and our georgian page, georgian page they were there i don't know if they're still there they just had our 03 cab and they said it was a phenomenal bottle it just absolutely held up so I'm really excited. We only have one case left of that. So I'm really excited. And it's our personal. It. We have one bottle left. I think Nick has already claimed it. I got a text from him. I didn't read all the way through. Yes, Nick has already okay, claimed it. Okay, he's shouting out. I see Nick. All right. <laughs> oh, okay. Nick, Don, you'll enjoy that. I, I'm yeah. stoked for you guys to get that. Um, but if something were, if we try to taste through our vault wines, that's normally when we would have our spring party is when we would pull out um, a random mixture of vault wines. And then those are the ones that we get to taste. And then we know okay, how they're doing. And then at all of the other parties, we do, you know, like the Venus or the Phoenix or the Barbera, but in that party, and then obviously we're not having that one this year, but we get to taste through and really taste them and see how they're holding up. Um, but Nate does always specify how long he recommends holding that in a cellar. And when he specifies that, he's saying that it should be at its peak and not turning yet by that cellar by date. He's not trying to say, oh, you know, it's going to already start turning and then you're going to have a crappy bottle of wine. He's saying drink it by then, but it will probably still hold up a little bit longer. But that's where it's, he's recommending that's where its peak is going to be. So. Yeah. And then so also on that real quick for, for anybody on that point. The darker, more tannic wines, Petite Syrah, Cabernet, Syrah, um, Tanat, which we're doing now too, guys. Um, Tempranillo, which we're doing now too. Um, some of those extremely dark, super rich wines, those are going to hold up longer than the lighter Grenache, Pinot Noir, Morved, um, yeah, or Rosés. Those, those need to be drank right away. So. Or within five well, to eight years within five to eight years but those are the ones we drink the other ones we can lay down and on that too i wanted to make a comment um that a lot of times there's a misconception about if you are opening up an aged bottle that you should put it in a decanter and let it decant exactly. for several hours before you drink it and that is a very very um unfortunate misconception you want to do that with your young wine 
You want to get air to your young wines because you want to go ahead and let those open up and get some oxygen to them because they have not had the opportunity yeah, to age. Job. When you are opening a cellared bottle, do not decant that. You can still go ahead and pour it through an aerator if you want. We've I meant to pour our wine through. Um, Nate loves the rattlesnake aerator pourer. You can go ahead and do something like that, but you don't need to be thoroughly aerating that because that has already laid down. That's already been aged. That's already got oxygen to it. And you're going to miss out on the, it, what you would enjoy in having that glass of wine straight out of the bottle or just a little bit of air to it. Of course, um, swirl it and aerate it and stuff, but don't decant your your aged wines because you're doing them a disservice by getting even more oxygen to something that's already had an opportunity to age. And uh, Chuck made a good point that uh, he is still enjoying some of our 2009 Moved, and he mm -hmm. said that it's lasting even for the lighter varietals that we have. So, which is kind of awesome because we've been talking a lot about our screw tops, and I'm gonna have Dre talk a little bit about those because. Um, often it's a question that comes up a lot in the tasting room is that people are surprised that we have screw tops and I'm going to have Dre kind of talk about how awesome they are. So they really are fantastic. So, um, when they started Vina Moda in 2003 with our very first Cabernet, by the way, the 2003, um, and that's why we call it the Godfather. Um, just did something on social media the other day asking if people know why we have a Roman numeral at the end of each of our bottles of Cabernet and that is for every successive child of the Godfather um, because that is really what started Vina Moda and we started out with 10 barrels One of Cabernet idol, 10 barrels. and um, that was right after he finished at UC Davis and at that point he'd only been making wine for other people and it was his first time just doing it without having to conform to what other people wanted. Um, but then in that, it's like, this is our brand new wine. Um, I wasn't around at that point, but I still call ours. Um, it's our brand new wine. It's our brand new project. This is our brand new thing. Um, this is all we have is this, this little bit of wine. And so how do we make sure that every single bottle is perfect um, for as long as people want to hold on to it? And so coming out of UC Davis, getting his um, enology education, and viticulture education um and then all of the studies that were coming out at that point screw caps were not a popular choice but they were beating out um so many other closures and so he chose a screw cap this is our one of our screw caps and inside the screw cap there is a Sterinex liner in there so anytime you open a bottle of Inamoda, you can look up under there there's that little white Sterinex liner there's different breathability factors of the Sterinex liner and nate chose and continues to choose um, a serenex liner that breathes at a quarter of the rate of a typical natural cork. And by doing that, not only is that going to breathe a little bit slower than a cork, um, he's able to use a quarter of the sulfites. And that's something that's so important to both of us. We're both very sensitive to sulfites. At this point, um, for me, I'm so incredibly sensitive that when we go wine tasting, I don't even get my own glass and Nate decides you know, if something is worth me putting it in my mouth at all, because it gets, it makes me very, very sick. And so um, he's able to make our wines with such low sulfites while still having that ageability because it breathes at such a, a slower rate. Um, and there's some misconceptions on that too, where in the beginning, it was just the aluminum uh, screw cap and there wasn't a liner. And so I actually took a master class recently with a sommelier who even now, this was, class was done last year said oh the screw caps have zero breathability because they're just aluminum and that's 20 year old information um now they all have the serenex liner that each winemaker gets to choose the breathability on that um but we're able to age our wines for so much longer with the consistency and i actually have a study that was recently done in australia because they are really the leaders of screw cap technology they've been doing studies for a long time on that um that i didn't bring with me it's at the tasting room but it is a picture of a white wine they took the exact same wine they bottled it um at the exact same time one with a screw cap and one with all these different closures and there's different uh quality of corks there's synthetic corks. there's all these different things and you can see because white wine is bottled in clear glass of flint and because white wine is supposed to be lighter in color as it ages and oxidizes it becomes more amber colored and you can see in this picture, um, I'll have Jess posted onto our social media so that you can see it, because obviously you can't come to the tasting room and see it. Um, but you can see the difference in uh, over 
they looked at it after 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, and 48 months of the color. And the screw cap bottle is the only one that's consistently the same color all the way through. And everything else has started to, to turn amber. And some of them are, are brown uh, by the end of the 48 um, months. And so um, you're able to age our wines quite a bit longer. And then so... so in 2003, back in the day when I decided to make this decision to go to the Stealth Enclosure Tops, when we first launched our tasting room at the old location, Vina Moda, 2005, around in there, and we we're doing our thing, people would come in and they'd say, oh my God, that's got to be shit. It's terrible. That's a Stelvin, that's a screw cap. That's like Thunderbird or Ripple. We're out of here. And they wouldn't even taste the wine. Yeah, they never even taste it, and they'd just walk out. And nowadays, people come in and say, thank you. Oh, my God. At least I know, no matter what, I'll have a fantastic bottle when I take this home and of our ageability. And then the other thing is that I can just run such low SO2s. Um, so the sulfites in the wine. You guys can drink and actually have a good time and partake maybe a little more than you wanted to and still feel fine the next morning. So, uh, I do love that I can give that to everybody. Um, hopefully we'll educate all the Here's haters. Mike. Yes. <laughs> so we have, let's probably call this our last question. Um, so Marcy asked, is there anything you can do with super old wine, sangria possibly, or how do you know when it is too old or past its prime? So one of the things that Sheila talked about is when you take the wine, you put it in the glass and you look at the color and you take a piece of white paper and she talked about that kind of amber color around the, the rim. And so a little bit of it is fine. It does show, like she said, it just shows that it's had some time to, to age and gain some character. But if it's straight up brown, a lot of times that'll indicate that it's become a little too oxidized. And then it'll have more vinegar qualities to it. You can go ahead and turn that into cooking wine. You can tr finish turning it into vinegar if you want. You salad can- Salad dressing. Yes, yeah, salad dressing, absolutely. Salad dressing, um, great. And uh -huh. then you can put it into mold wine in the winter time. You can absolutely turn it into sangria. It shouldn't make you sick as long as you're not just straight up drinking a whole bottle of basically vinegar. And if you have a wine that you have consistently enjoyed and you bought several bottles because you love it and then you're drinking the wine and it's very good and it does peak and then it starts to go down, as long as you're enjoying the wine, it's just Absolutely. fine. So like a wine like that, it, there's no flaw in the wine. It's just maybe a little past its prime. So it's still enjoyable. It's not the wine you used to know. It's just like all of us gets a little old over, a little tired, um, but that's okay. So those type of wines, um, I think even if you miss that perfect window where they're just peaking, it's okay if you're having it maybe a year later and it's not as fabulous as it was. And the cellaring question that was earlier is my rule of thumb is if it has acid. So, you know, Nate mentioned their Viognier. That's a white wine that's got plenty of acid. It's gonna hold on for a really long time. And that's part of this conversation is Cabernet Sauvignon has that Sauvignon Blanc mommy, um, the mother of Cabernet Sauvignon that gives it enough acid that gives it ageability. So um, Morvedra, somebody had a 2009 Marvetra in there, that wine naturally has a lot of acid in it. So it's going to age really well. But like you said, Grenache, not so much acid. So if you know kind of like the uh, um, acidity of the wine, I was going to hold up. I know everybody's got lots of time to read um, these days. There's a great book called Wine Folly. She's got a blog. So if you are not able to get a book. This is the old cover, the new cover is black, but you could open it up to any grape, Muscat Blanc, and it's gonna give you the flavor profile of that grape. It's gonna tell you how acidic it is. It's gonna tell you the fruit. It's gonna tell you all the stuff in two pages. So you don't have to be a wine expert, but if you're exploring and you're picking something out of the cellar and you're like, I can't tell if this wine is good. I can't tell what it's supposed to taste like because I've never had it before. This is a great cheat sheet. You can just pop it right in. Um, so Wine Folly is a great book. Um, if you really want to delve into stuff, Wine Bible is great. All of the stuff, it's like 
historical fiction or nonfiction. It gives you stories. It tells you, takes it all the way back to some of these people that have done amazing things with wine. Um, so this one's a fun one to kind of dip into. And then if you really can't stand nonfiction, there's something like Billionaire's Vinegar. This is uh, based on how people trade and collect wines that maybe they shouldn't have and some of the fraud. And so there's lots of intrigues. So if you like things like Da Vinci Code, this would be a good book for you. There's lots of great wine books out there to kind of wet your palate while you're drinking some Vinamota wine. So uh, I hope everybody's had a good time. This has been a blast for me and I want to do this again. I hope you guys are enjoying it. Yeah. Thank so, you, Sheila, in Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Nate. We cannot wait. I'm telling you, uh, Jeff and I are already talking about when we're going to come back to California and pick some grapes with you. We awesome. are wondering, so since this is our first time doing this class and we cannot thank everyone enough for coming, this is so awesome. What would be a varietal that you are interested in us exploring next? So if anyone wants to unmute themselves, answer or send it in here, whatever, um, we would love Tempranillo. to hear what are some of the things. Tempranillo. Ooh, uh, you guys, the temper, okay. Cabernet, the Cabernet of Spain. I love it. I love Spanish wines. I love Spanish varieties. Um, what about wine pairings? What do you guys feel about stuff like that? Do you feel comfortable with the, somebody was making veal earlier. Are you comfortable picking out the right Vinamona wine to go with whatever you're cooking for dinner? Um, what do you guys think about something like that? That would be fun. I, I want to know if I can share this video. Yes, yeah, so Patty, what I'm going to do, hopefully, is I recorded this and we will upload it to our YouTube and then okay. you can access it and then I'll share it on Facebook and stuff. But um, we should be, hopefully, the recording went well and uh you should be able to access this uh at any point after pretty much this evening so and also we do have nate recorded a video last week we only have two subscribers on our youtube and that's me and jess um <laughs> we recorded a very short video just a story time with nate um last week and then our daughter was working on editing a uh, his most recent video and uh, trying to get it to upload today but if it's not already up there today it'll be up there within the next 24 hours and it's a story um a very amusing story from when nate was uh, stuck in moab with no transportation um back when he had just graduated high school so we're gonna do we're gonna try and get into doing videos at least once a week um sometimes they'll be wine related and sometimes there'll be stories about our, you know our lives and then i'm hoping my sister will be able to do some YouTubes like the one I had mentioned in my Facebook Live about doing a thing about for wine, uh, for beer drinkers and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, so, and then anytime we do one of these classes, now that we are figuring this out, um, we plan to record it and then upload that to YouTube as well. So oh, go like and subscribe. It's Vina Moda Winery. We can't, um, it's got a really long, like actual link just because just you're it, not allowed to customize put it in the box. chat box i just put the link in on the in the chat but oh, i yeah. will we'll be posting like on oh, facebook yeah. for more information and it's in our most recent two emails as yeah. well to the wine club then we're gonna do a whole lot more videos not just me telling a few stupid stories we're gonna do like fun stuff ones, from right? all, the girls, all the girls stories I only want stupid stories. <laughs> well, the, funny, it is. It's actually the stories are going to be pretty damn good. So I can't yeah. wait for you guys to go. Like, that's my life. I lived it. I did it. I just Thank subscribed. You. Woo! Yeah. Don't be I love we have your view. To customize our channel name. I love your view, guys. Yeah, we're well, you. I'll open it up a little more. There we go. Oh, I know. So, hey, all you guys out there in the world. This is this is the next home site of Vinamoto Winery. Well, over this is, our, this is our property site. The winery is not right here. This is where our house is actually going to go. But over a little ways is where our winery is going to go. So, so for you guys, when the county finally permits us and lets us do what we need to do, 
this is going to be our view and this is where you guys oh, are going to get to go. Oh, 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 oh. So my next Facebook Live is going to be showing everyone the, the winery spot where it'll be once we get approval from the county and get started. So I'm thinking probably Saturday. And I know Nick and Don specified I could give 24 hours notice on Facebook and that would be enough to let people know. I'm thinking probably Saturday because I'll probably shower on Saturday. Um, so Saturday I'll post something on, uh, on our uh, social media, letting you know when that will be. But I'll show everybody the winery site uh, where folks will be. Spent. How's what? Thank you guys so much for including me in this. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Sheila. You did great. Thank you guys. And we have Dre's and Sheila's dad in the group, and Dre's godfather. So it's quite the family affair. This has been a blast for me. I absolutely love talking to people about wine. And if anything, the whole point is to demystify these things. You already love wine, but then it's like, why do I love wine? It's just like why I love a painting or a flower or anything else that's really beautiful. So I just hope you guys got something out of it. And uh, I would love to participate in any of these uh, in the future. So it's been lovely seeing all your faces and getting to know you from Oklahoma. So. No, I think that Sheila's godfather is also here. Is Tony here? I yeah, think so. yeah. I, I see a note from Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Both the godfathers. <laughs> Hopefully one of them was drinking a godfather. Oh. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll put together um, another class. We'll take some of your notes on what varietal you'd like to do next. And um, we want to keep doing this. I, we had already talked about doing some wine classes um, throughout the year, even before all this stuff happened. And now we're just doing it in a different format. But this has been so fun. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we had a great time. I know, we did. And, and everybody, thank you so much. Like, this is normally I get to talk to all you guys in our tasting room and we're drinking a little bit, we're hanging out, we're, we're doing our thing. But normally we get to tell these stories so that's why we did this little bit of youtube like let's tell a story about our life or something that happened because i i miss telling these funny off the wall stories and when you guys tell me stories so that's really what i'm hoping out of this so if y'all want to watch and whatever but yeah they're all 100 percent true what's happened in our life but i can't wait for you guys like counter post something and be like oh well you did that let's see this so that's what I'm hoping. Okay, I think that's it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us. This was amazing. Absolutely. Right. And I'm going to work on not using awesome. <laughs> going to look up some words. Right. Awesome. Awesome. Jess. Awesome. 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 Bye. Good night, Thank everyone. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. We miss you all. Good yes, job, we miss you. Bye. Bye. There's George and Paige. Oh. And there's Art. There's Art. There's Courtney. What's up? Yeah. I need to show you the picture. Hello, she got ham baby. <laughs> Can you see that ham baby? Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <my God>. <laughs> It's one of the stories you guys will have to sign in for. I don't think that we'll be telling yeah, that story. It was, it was good to see you, even though it was remote, right? So Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Bye, everybody. Bye, thanks yeah. a lot, Sheila. Thanks a lot, Dre. Thanks a lot, Nate. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Art. Thank you for being here. Bye. In Vino Veritas. Until next yeah. time. Yeah. Until next time. Cheers. I miss you guys. We miss, uh, we miss, miss you. Too. Hopefully see you soon. Hope so. Jess, yeah, you all look beautiful, by the way. I was like, oh, oh you're crazy. I was going to put on, like, makeup and maybe do my hair, but then went on a hike. We just golfed. And just golfed, so I was kind of like, well, this is, this is what everyone's getting. <laughs> We've been baby version of disc golf in my house. It is amazing. I need to share that picture with me. Oh, oh my god. god. I'll grab it. Oh. <laughs> you see how little this thing is? <laughs> it looks like an Easter basket. It is 
literally Logan size, and it is the greatest thing that we have going in the house right now. Yes. Love it. And it made me thank like you guys so much. <laughs> Oh. Hi, Tracy. All right. Tracy, Bye. we're all unmuted. Thank you for joining us today. That's so awesome. Oh, look at your tiny little puppy. Can you unmute her? Mm -hmm. All right, I'm heading I'm trying out. to unmute you, Tracy. Oh, wait, Tracy, hang on. Oh, there you oh, go. Bye, Sheila. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Awesome. We had so much fun. Let's do it again. Yes. Absolutely. Hi, Tracy. It's so nice to virtually meet you <laughs> face to face. Thank you for joining us today. It's awesome. It's like, oh my God. Of course, Tish invited us. So. Okay. Awesome. That's so great. Wonderful. So here's our little. It's so cute. We have been locked inside for three weeks, and this is what came out of it. Oh. <laughs> Puppy. And the serious part is, it's not mine, and it's not Blake's. We're not sure where it came from. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Liz. Oh, so cute. So freaking cute. Look at her. Oh, she's a, what's her name? Coco. Coco. Oh, my gosh. She's adorable. There's a little we have dog here, too, but they're not small enough to pick up <laughs> and they kept wanting to well luna she came in she's like i'm ready to be the star of the show and i'm like no yeah no it's so dry. i didn't even like i'm like yeah well so i'm like well now you figured out who i am <laughs> yes you i saw that your your note come up of who you are yes Nice to virtually meet you. Yes, and we're going to around this bottle of wine. It is a Cabernet, but it's not yours. Then you're I, That's okay. I have tried. <laughs> I'm like, I walk, oh, yeah, we're members of a lot. We're frequenters. That's okay. Like, once all this is over, you can come in and taste our wine and see what you like. Yeah, and we're easy. doing, right now, obviously, we're not open, but we're doing um, scheduled curbside pickups. If you wanted to try any, we have um, on our Facebook and our Instagram, Jess just posted all of the varietals that we currently have because we have our regular lineup is six bottles, but we have a bunch of different wines in the tasting room right now of um, previous vintages, all different varietals. So if you hop on there, um, it'll show you, it's pinned to the top of the page and it'll show you what all varietals that we have available right now and then their, their prices and we're doing some specials and stuff right now and then we're happy to come meet you to do a curbside pickup if you'd like. We're gonna join. <laughs> Isn't she cheap? She's, she's adorable. Gosh. Okay, so look at this little thing. Yeah, we have to watch out and not step on I know, she's, she's, <laughs> oh my God. Aw, she just wants to snuggle. I'm gonna tell the schools I need a therapy dog. Yes, absolutely. I think everyone needs a therapy dog at this point. This woman's crazy. She's <laughs> self-medicating and she needs a therapy dog. <laughs> <laughs> I just never. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so we love it. I, I'm hoping this place bounces back. I think it will. You know, we're such a tight-knit community and we support each other so well. And, um, you know, we're very resilient. Yeah. So, you know, we, this is not our first time facing adversity as a community. It is the weirdest, I would say. Um, but it's not our first time facing adversity, and we'll definitely bounce back and, and support each other any way we need. So I'm sure of it. And that's a, such a plus. Mm -hmm. yep. a beautiful community. Yes, we love it. We've been coming up here for five years during spring break from Orange County. And we literally, oops, a daisy. Uh, we literally um, pulled up and moved up. I mean, I you know, I think there. that happens a lot because um, that it's what happened. Well, it took me a year from the first day that I came till the day that I moved. But um, it happens a lot. People come here, and uh, I grew up in the military, and so we moved around a lot. And I always 
was told and what was what we believed was home is where you are and where your loved ones are. And, but I never knew what home felt like. Home was just where I was at any given time. This is home. And I felt that from the first day that I ever came to Murphy's. I just, in the area, Calaveras, but Murphy specifically. Because I'm from South Dakota, like, right? Like, we'd be coming up here and first spring break because we, you know, could drive up here. Where's Murphy? Where's Murphy? Yeah, where's that place? It's so small. It doesn't really, like, it, it ring a bell on most maps unless somebody's told you about it. Here's like what, when we were moving or when we were driving up here for the last five years, I'm like, oh my God, it's so flipping beautiful. It's just like people don't even know it. No, like, well, and I, you know, I want, I want some people to know it enough to keep us all around, but, but not too many people. Um, when we bought this place uh, six, a little over six years ago, I mean, can you believe this view? That's our morning every morning we wake up to the sunrise over the lake and uh it's taken us six years it's never been inhabited before so we had to bring in power poles and septic and um get a, a well and uh, you know, everything cut in a driveway and cut in the pad and, and we still don't have a house yet but um when we first tried to drive out here the road was so rough that we couldn't even get here so we just rode it off and then the owner was also the real estate agent and she just said no no there's a different way to get out there you have to see this place you have to and uh so we were very reluctant but we came out and we we're just like i how we can't even go on vacation and and be in a place this beautiful <laughs> so where did you come from dre um, I, so I was raised in a military family. My dad was in the Air Force, um, but I was born in Florida. Then uh, from Florida, we moved to Nebraska. From Nebraska, we moved to California, um, spent some time um, in the south of Georgia, and then in Arizona. And then we moved uh, from California, we moved to Germany. We lived in Heidelberg when the Berlin Wall came down and when Germany was reunified. And then from there, my dad got stationed in Alabama, but my sister was a junior in high school and I was a freshman. And so my parents didn't want my sister to have to go to three different high schools and for me to go to two different high schools. So um, we moved here to California and then my dad moved to Alabama and then joined us 